run time. This is pretty cool. <coughs> So we're going to shift gears now. It's a lot of uh, a lot of Android Wear, some pretty cool stuff. I think the the Code Labs will be great. Um, we're going to shift gears into uh, not Android talk into Polymer, which is more specifically for web applications. And I'm going to bumble through. Actually, I'm mirroring. I should, have, I should have asked if anybody needed a break. It'll be good. If you need to get up, I, I won't be too terribly afraid. <laughs> so, um, I'm Lloyd Cleveland. I'm one of the managers, or co-organizers of the Google Developer Group Twin Cities. I also work here at McAllister College um, in uh, advancement and fundraising and write a lot of custom web apps for, for that team, for that, well, whatever. Um, I, I enjoy, I've really um, been enjoying getting into Polymer and, and learning about what, what tools and power this provides for people who are building web applications. So today I'm going to go uh, do an overview, talk a little bit about web components and kind of invite you all to, to join this revolution that's happening. So we're going to start with some high-level um, high level review of what are web components. Uh, get up so that we're all on the same page. And um, what you know, a good way of thinking about any kind of new technology. Uh, there's a, a lot of new technology that happens a lot. One way to think about it is what problems are we solving? What are the issues that are happening that this uniquely provides an answer to? Um, and so, how are web components going to make it easier for us to do our job? Well, web applications are, are really becoming that. They're really expected to be a full-fledged application. They're not necessarily landing on any uh, standard device. You know, the days of designing a website for uh, 800 by 600 screen are, are kind of out the window. You need to be able to easily adapt your application to a myriad of device sizes. And we're all smart developers. We, we do a good job at this. Um, but it's work. So to give an example, something like UI, doing some UI tabs should be pretty easy. I mean, this is 2014 already. Um, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, right now, so here's an example of how many of us doing a web app these days. Um, here's an example of kind of Bootstrap or Foundation. Some libraries do a mix of HTML and JavaScript. Uh, some try and do as much as they can within JavaScript. And we're all super smart, right? And after a few times of doing this, it's not so big a deal, but it's still really repetitive in the wrong places, and unnecessarily so. And they're all solving the same problem, um, but they're all doing it in a different way, which makes us developers have to consistently they constantly learn new frameworks, and most frustratingly, they're often not compatible. Uh, so loading a bootstrap with a framework, uh, or Angular and Backbone, and they, you start to get collisions with, with the framework that you're building. So this really is where web components uh, show their true power. So with web components, we can create our own custom HTML elements. You can create paper tabs, have its own look, and feel and behavior, and they're built on the web platform. 
can be used in any project, reused in other projects, extended within that project in true um, kind of developer, what we would expect from a, a real developer tool. So how is this possible? How did we get to this point? Uh, a number of engineers from different web uh, browser companies, so Google, Firefox, Opera, Internet Explorer got together and started to agree on a new spec, uh, looking at common problems that web developers were facing, needing things like templating, scoping of your, of your definitions, encapsulation, resource management. And these web components really are a quantum leap in web development. But I do want to quickly differentiate between web components and Polymer. So the, are kind of talking about it in the same conversation, and want to, I, I do want to draw a clean line between web components, uh, which often come up in the same conversation as Polymer, because Polymer is built on web components. And Google, it, the perception may be that Google kind of owns or is in charge of web components, which isn't true. Uh, web components are part of the HTML5 spec. They're, they're open standards. You can implement web components with Google tools or without. I'll get into some details of that just a little bit later. And the HTML5 spec and CSS3 are owned by the W3C, um, a consortium of developers across all browsers and, and kind of leading the edge of web development. So web components really break down they're, the thing that defines a web component are four key elements. <coughs> the ability to create custom elements, have HTML templates, the shadow DOM, which is about the coolest thing ever, and HTML imports. So custom elements allow us to define new HTML elements. And the problem that this solves is this. This is a, a modern web application that many of us use on a day-to-day -day basis. This is kind of behind the scenes. You open your, your dev tools in Gmail. And in order to not have conflicting div CSS definitions, you've got this crazy soup that's, that's well, it's clearly not readable um, and, and obviously maintainable, but it takes some, some serious doing. Basically, HTML has not kept up. So web components allow us to turn our divs into components that look like other HTML elements, which, make, which makes it very readable, meaningful, because you can read this code, tell what's going on. We're leveraging the web platform. Um, and it's a, you have a common extension model, so you can build upon elements that you've built in other projects or other people may have built and published, and you can extend upon them. Since you already know how to work with HTML and the DOM, you already know how to work with these custom elements. There's a common way to, to extend uh, and, and work with those. So one of the other attributes that, or elements that comes up is our templating. Um, you have real templating in the browser. So most of us building web applications are, are fairly familiar with you know, pretty standard. You have to build a template uh, in your server-side application. The um, web components allow you to build your templates on the client side. So spec writers saw that everybody needed these templates and said, hey, why don't we make this part of the, the web platform? You've got a template tag, which is now the template tag is a web component tag. The content is inert uh, until cloned or used. It's meaning it kind of sits on the page and doesn't actually do anything until it's instantiated on the page. Um, and it's not part of, the, part of the page. So one of the other real powers that come with these web components is the idea of a shadow DOM. So imagine a bubble of CSS or markup that's scoped. So your CSS styles don't affect the parent document. External JavaScript can mess with elements within your component. Um, one, of the, one of the examples that they give in the Polymer project is setting up a simple uh, Polymer element and redefining the CSS of, say, H2 as orange. Well, just within your web component, that item, which is 
H2, which is a pretty commonly used tag, is orange, but nothing else on the page is affected. It allows you to really define and, and kind of work with basic um, markup tags and not worry about site.css or style, you know, other uh, style definitions changing how you intend your element to look. Of course, there's a workaround for that because there needs to be. Um, so one of the beauties of the Shadow DOM is you've actually been using it for years. So a common markup is this video uh, with the source and enabling this controls attribute. You now have a play button, a, a mute. You've got all these controls that are embedded in your video. Well, this is, um, it, it's like it's magic, right? But it's actually a Shadow DOM. You could open the dev tools, enable show your UA elements. Uh, the shadow DOM, and inside that tag, inside the shadow root, you've got um, you've got the markup that's used with the standard video controller. So browser makers have have they kind of been holding out on us, uh, and this allows us to, to roll it in. So HTML imports allows you to import HTML documents into your application. This is this looks a lot like. Um, the server-side imports that we're used to doing on, if you have access to, to server. Um, and it, what the nice thing about it is it fundamentally changes the way that we're able to work with these libraries. Here's an example for boot, Bootstrap. To even get your, your hero element up on a basic page, you have to import about six lines, six, six different files, your JavaScript and CSS and some different elements. Um, that's a lot of stuff to include. Using HTML imports, that's broken down to just one line. Now, many of you might be thinking, I might have heard this story before. So here's an example of one of the um, sample polymer uh, tutorials where each of the custom elements that you're bringing in, you need to individually call I put my anyway. Um, so this the, it does cause its own its own problem. Let's say my okay. So sorry, I, I, I broke my rhythm. But um, so there's this there's elements of Polymer. So this is stepping outside a little bit of web components, and I call these uh, Polymer pixie dust, uh, which is not the official term where you've got uh, this, this tool called Vulcanize. And so by running from the command line to Vulcanize one of your files, what it does is it, it imports, it looks through your HTML file and checks for any imports that might be called. And then rather than loading, uh, having a browser, which most of course, you know, it, our home base is our desktop with a 27 inch screen right on a super fast connection. You don't care if uh, the New York Times takes 320 unique web calls. But on a mobile device, that, that matters. Each one of those uh, HTTP requests are expensive. This Vulcanize command will look through all of your file and import all of them and flatten them into one file, or even inline them all into a single file. It makes for a much longer <coughs> single file but it, um, it reduces the HTTP imports. So you can also um, incorporate Vulcanize into your build process. There's Grunt, Grunt Vulcanize or Gulp Vulcanize. Um, so web components, four key parts. There's the custom elements, templates, the Shadow DOM, and HTML imports. So to use this, how, how to use it, you can find them. There's a, a number of different repositories, a site like uh, customelements.io. You can use a package manager like Bower to, to download and install, which will, which will go check for any dependencies and bring them into your application. And then you just import them uh, up in the head of your document. Import the resources you need and the library handles the loading of any resources that are needed and they're ready to use. So you can compose elements together. Here are a couple nested uh, elements 
which will uh, result in a toolbar with some text in the middle that's, that's nicely centered. It's got a couple of core icons. With, this is from the core icon set. You've got your hamburger menu, some refresh, uh, different actions that you can, you can tie into them. I like to point out for Polymer, there's kind of two key reasons why using Polymer, what on, in addition to um, web components, uh, there's, there's many more reasons why Polymer is pretty great, um, but for now I really want to highlight two. There's polyfills and simply the library of elements that come with using Polymer. So polyfills are, are, um, answer this question of what is the, the browser support. So web components, uh, in the summer of 2014, if you did a survey of all of the standard uh, major web browsers that exist, they're supported pretty well across most of the major, the four key requirements that we talked about for web components are met across the different browsers, um, which is a lot better than it was even less than a year ago. Um, by bringing in Polymer and Polyfills, which, which comes when one of the initial imports we bring are web components, so the JavaScript file which will, will check a number of things, it adds a bunch of syntactic sugar with polymer.js that is in part of the web components. So this browser support of web components now goes from partial support in some browsers to full support across all modern browsers. And now that we have full support for web components, we can explore what we get from these different technologies. So the first one being custom elements. Um, we'll kind of walk through some code of first showing uh, how to create custom elements in vanilla JS uh, and then Polymer and, and how to use it. So the way you uh, use a vanilla element is just you register the element on your document, document.registerElement, you give it a name, a prototype, and in Polymer, they've said that, hey, you know, kind of declarative is the way to go. So you create a custom element that allows you to create custom elements on top of that. This Polymer element is the root element name. Um, and then using the Polymer element tag, you give it a name, and the content inside is rendered. So you would use that on your page by uh, referring the tag based on the name that it is. So also talked about extending elements and the power of that. Say you want to create a button that's not just a button, it's a super button. Uh, you, in vanilla JS, you would pass a tag name, a prototype of the thing you want to extend from, and pass in the HTML tag name you're extending. In Polymer, it's pretty well slimmed down. You just pass in the tag name, and they'll sort out the prototype. And to use this, new type extension element will say the button is a super button um, and you can extend native HTML or other people's uh, custom elements. So one of the other kind of uh, syntactic sugaring are, are of course are the templates. Using templates is super easy. In vanilla you just use the template tag, um, declare some of its uh, the, the pieces that are used within it with JavaScript in Polymer, there's a, there's a base structure for each element. And so every element, by default, will have a template, or by definition, will have a template. Um, so the content you place in your template is what will appear on the screen when it's used. In addition, there's a number of kind of um, hooks that are now available to you, like you can bind to data models, you can iterate, there's conditionals available to you. It's, uh, it really makes uh, some pretty powerful pieces to put in. So, um, the Shadow DOM is, is really powerful, but there's ways that uh, working with it, there's some tricks that may come up. So, here's a, in Vanilla.js, you select an element, call create shadow root, and fill it with the HTML, either with inner HTML or a template. In Polymer, the definition is any time you have a template in your element, it by default will have its own shadow DOM wrapped around that element. So, components. 
In traditional app development, we're used to using uh, standard markup tags and working within a site a CSS at the site level, or maybe the page level has its own kind of overrides of the site CSS. Uh, that you try and make a consistent feel, look and feel across the, all the different pages. Um, and they're fairly generic. So but what if your HTML could look more like more declarative as to what actually is happening. With mark components, they have their own contained markup um, or inherit the markup from globally declared design. So that's really kind of covering the polyfills that the, using the Polymer library, one makes it uh, fully functional on mo all modern browsers and extends all of these uh, elements available to you. So the other, I think, big win with using Polymer is this library of elements that, that has already been created. Um, I was just at a conference where Mike spoke uh, last last week on all about mobile technology and, and mobile uh, the thought leaders, and if I see another one of these graphs about how mobile traffic is overtaking <laughs> desktop, uh, I might scream, so thank you for not including one of those. <laughs> I obligatorily did a bunch. Um, but so knowing what we know now about mobile devices, what if, what if we started over? Uh, we could work with elements that have a look and feel like the kind of elements we're used to seeing on iOS or Android. Um, and these are, these are all part of the core element set that come with, with Polymer. You've got a core icon with a search, a field, a paper um, button there, this core drawer, drawer panel, which will extend out the side content on a larger screen and hide it on a smaller screen. So core elements uh, are, are as from the Polymer library, a set of general purpose, general utility elements. So one of the things is this basic container for tabs or buttons of core toolbar. Um, like any custom element, first you import the definition, and then you just work with the tag. In this example, we've nested a div. This has a pointer right here. Uh, there's a div here in the middle of core toolbar, <coughs> and the the template then wraps this, this display out appropriately. Because custom elements are really all about composability, nest, you can nest additional items in, like uh, another core icon button to get your hamburger menu, um, next to your div. So a common pattern is to nest a core toolbar in another element called this core header panel. And the core header panel is a simple container with this header section on top. And it's a good place to nest a toolbar in the content section below here. And the headers panel is to manage the scrolling of our page. By default, it'll pin that, the toolbar to the top. And at this point, we've written about eight lines of code and gotten all of this element. There's, in this example, there's a bunch of filler divs, but you understand that <coughs> the, the content there. Pretty nice experience. On a larger screen, that um, you can change the look and feel or height of that header panel based, again, on the conditionals that are available. And we're not writing a bunch of JavaScript or CSS or importing that into every single page that we want to have something like this happening. Because these elements are configurable, we can change the mode of the panel. So by adding mode equals scroll to this, the, the toolbar disappears when you scroll up the page. And um, there's other kind of core tools within this core set that allow for a nice responsive design. That effortlessly look good on a desktop or on a, um, that have this side drawer panel and the content. And by default, it'll only display the main area on smaller screens. You can combine all of these, the toolbar, the header panel, and the drawer panel. And with those three elements combined, we've got now a pretty sophisticated experience. 
So Google I.O., this, this last summer, they announced Paper Elements, which is the new kind of UI, the best thinking of uh, the user experience team at Google on how things should look on, in mobile and, and on the web with these paper elements. So with Core Polymer, there's a whole suite of tools that, ex that wrap these core actions with the paper UI. They're more stylized, and they, they enable animation and spatial relationships. So this paper input tag has a few interesting attributes, like this floating label, uh, data validation, the error label, and all of this without a bunch of JavaScript and CSS again. And that means they've taken things like your standard text box and modernized it for 2014. This is the a element called paper checkbox. Has a touch action, a paper ripple happening when you touch. Um, the transition, more of a fluid look and feel to the application. Uh, paper ripple is when you where you click or touch on an element. It gives this uh, more active um, feel to your application. And this is a simple drop-in to get your elements. You just put your paper ripple tag here inside of the div. Uh, add this fit to it, and it will expand the paper ripple all the way out to the edges of that containing element. Not a bad effect for a single line and 20 characters. So, the other elements of paper, of paper that, that are, are um, fairly iconic is the idea of this paper shadow and the z-depth that elements should have um, layers to them. You should have a sense of what, what elements are on top of other ones um, on the page. It makes your elements kind of spring, spring to life and have a, a nicer feel and, and reaction to them. So, styling. We've uh, talked a little bit about material design. Let's talk briefly about theming. And how do you make these elements look like they belong on your site across a bunch of different elements? So taking uh, a pseudo-element, like this paper slider with a min and max, um, it's got its own contained shadow DOM. To style that, in your CSS markup, you, you need to um, say within the, that shadow element and change the style. You can also pierce all shadow DOMs on your page with this deep tag. And allows you to do um, something like setting the background color for all paper elements as, say, this green. So there's a link, I think it's pretty small, on this, um, on this screen. It has a kind of a playground of all of the different play, uh, paper elements that are available to you in the, the Palmer suite. Uh, one of the, the flagship Polymer app is this app called Topeka, and it rolls together a bunch of different uh, experiences that you can make pretty simply uh, combining different Polymer and uh, paper elements. It uh, has animations, here we go. <laughs> um, animations created with the core animations. Uh, you can do really powerful stuff with it. It's a little quiz app that will walk you through a standard set of questions, uh, collect your results, and, and you can play within different um, topics, subject topics. So, in tonight's talk, we don't really have time to touch on all the elements. <laughs> Uh, the Polymer project lives at polymer-project.org, um, and there you can find examples of all of the different core elements and paper elements and uh, tutorials that, from that page uh, that are pretty nice to work with. So one of the things of, of Google building their library of web components, uh, they're not alone. Mozilla is build, building their uh, kind of st experience set. <coughs> Uh, an element set called Brick. It's designed with the Firefox OS in mind. 
and it has a standard uh, similar look and feel. They're, they're named just a little differently. And Brick uses the polyfills from the polymer project, which means that you can use polymer, brick, vanilla web components together in the same application and not worry about stepping on each other's toes or breaking something deep in your site. So one of the things about uh, web components that really extends even to makes it more powerful is it's not just the browser makers that are making this. There's tons of developers that are building custom elements and publishing them on GitHub or customelements.io. So here's some examples. There's this element of app router. Uh, Eric Greensmith has uh, this element which allows the page to manage um, basically handling the routing requests within the um, hash change in the, the browser address bar. Uh, co combining the, the change of that and HTML5 push state. So Adi Asami has built this uh, pager element which allows you to, to add some pretty nice paging elements uh, to your application. There's Ajax forms that will allow post back and validation with, by just adding this element to your page. Including full blown web apps running uh, currently on Polymer. The entire Polymer project is built using Polymer elements. The Chrome status.com, the Chromium dashboard, is uh, heavily using uh, web components and, and Polymer elements. There's, um, I should put this at the end, but this is, a, this is a pretty cool tool to use on building web components, uh, Polymer web components, within a tool that is itself a Polymer web component. Uh, if I have time, near the end, I might walk through a demo of, of doing that. GitHub is using for the timestamp is a, is a web component um, for the X minutes ago widget. And not just Google. Sales, the folks at Salesforce have started turning their APIs into um, elements and, and web components. Which brings us to these APIs, as web developers, we spend a lot of time working with APIs to, to exchange data, consume data, publish data. Um, and APIs as elements. Again, a lot of the work that, we, that we're used to doing as web developers is, you know, you've done, you've built uh, something like a Google map four or five times, it's fine, you understand, you import. Um, well, here's my example, you want to add a, a marker to Google Map. There's so much code for just one, to get one marker to show up on your page. Well, in the world of web components, this is just a single tag. In, in the body, of course, up, up top, we've imported the element. But, so you import the element, you put it on your page, and you've got a map now on your, inside your application. You don't have to know how to style the CSS. Use a container to load the library, you just include it on your page, and you're done. And you pass in variables, since Maps, anybody who's worked with Google Maps knows it's a really rich API. Uh, it has lots of things that are valuable to us, like centering the map using latitude and longitude, setting the zoom level, uh, adding pins. In Web Components, you can expose the functionality of your API through attributes of your component, and it will recenter them um, and reset the, the zoom level. So, if you and including something like a map marker is as easy as nesting a Google map marker with its own elements into the page. There, I should make a note if I can have time to show you the concept. Um, all right. So they, the team at Google, the Web Component team, has been going around to all the different product teams and working with them to, to try and publish as many 
of their, their APIs. There's over 250 Google APIs that, that you have available to you as a, as a developer. And they've published them all on GitHub in this uh, Google Web Components repository. So things like working with maps, spreadsheets, calendars, Street View. Uh, there's one example that I, I uh, was just toying with of Google Sign-In. Google Sign-In with a single line of code. It's pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Um, one of the other, I think, side benefits, and I don't know how to, how to quantify this, but the whole web, the Polymer team, um, I've really been struck by the, the level of intentionality and um, education that they've committed to. There's a series of uh, Google Web uh, YouTube channels that talk about getting you up to speed with Polymer and web components. The whole uh, polymerproject.org is well, um, uh, well, well laid out, I think, with the, the heart of a teacher. Um, I'll point out uh, Rob Dodson here in a little bit. So learning web components, webcomponents.org, it's a great repository, <laughs> lots of communication, lots of uh, kind of discussion about where these should be, um, where it should be headed with this. I will add that uh, web components are not, uh, they're not fully official, as we talked about, as for the, the web specs, since not all browsers support them. Uh, the Polymer project itself is still in what's technically a uh, developer beta. Uh, the current version they just released this, this week, again, as, as we tend to do right before a, a big demo day, um, updated all the versions to 0 0.5. Uh, most of the functionality is still there. All the tutorials are still going to work great. But it's, it's still being shaped. And so what that means is your voice is important. And, and Things you would like to see included, or ideas you have, there's a lot of fairly open ears within the project. Um, so the polymerproject.org has a great getting started uh, tutorial. Well, this is uh, anyway. So Polycast is one of the shows on YouTube, hosted by Rob Dodson. Rob Dodson is is a member of the um, Web Standards team at Google. And he really has been kind of the front face, uh, in a lot of ways, of uh, the Polymer project. Um, and then these are great. These are all about 8 or 12 minutes long tutorials covering a simple element like a uh, custom icon set. And he'll walk through in a nice, uh, nice manner and get you up to speed on how you would make your own custom icons or modify the core icon set. So, but you've got to build stuff. You have to get your hands dirty. Um, if you want to make a Polymer application, uh, Yeoman has a, a great kind of uh, seed app, um, which adds support for SAS and page, spe page speed insights and some other things. If you're not into Yeoman, there's a seed element out in Polymer Labs for you to start building your own custom application, um, which is out. Um, so. Andy Osami also put together one of these dev, dev by YouTube videos on how to, that walks you through creating your own custom element. So you, first you create your element and share it. That's really where we're going to get the most power from this. Um, oops, I dropped this couple of slides. Or maybe they're coming up. Anyway, for the code labs today, I might be bouncing around here a little bit. Um, one of the other code projects is there's a Chrome extension, which is, uh, it's a, 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 technically it's a Chrome app. So in the, the Chrome uh, app store, there's the Chrome dev editor. So you'd be able to build, run, debug your own Polymer project and web application from within Chrome itself, which will, will save a little bit of time of setting up Node or a local server, uploading those sorts of things. It also does a lot of the... Um, Uh, package management for you. Um, if you so <laughs> getting back to share, you need to share the things that you're that you're building. So there's a, a node extension for custom elements uh, within your um, your Bower definition. If you add web components to the keywords, 
and push it out to be published uh, within Bower, then it will be picked up within customelements.io and show up in that, that catalog of, of elements. So then we, we need to explore. Um, approach this with an open mind, we've got some hard problems, uh, and it's kind of up to us to figure out the best way to, to solve these. Um, so we've got a little bit of time. I want to say thank you, first of all. These slides are posted on, I just posted them to my uh, Google Plus page. So uh, google.com plus Lloyd Cledwin um, is where these slides are. They have links to lots of those resources. Uh, we have a couple, let's see if we have, um, it is about breaking things. All right, so we're back here. I am going to hold you captive as we do Polymer Project, whoop, Polymer Project Tools Designer. <coughs> so here's this designer tool. You've got this um, kind of open space and then a palette from which to choose from. One of the uh, core components is our drawer panel. So we're just going to drop that over here. <coughs> Resize that to fit. Oh, this doesn't look so great. Um, whoops. I'm going to make that hide. Click that. Anyway, so here's our drawer panel. Um, one of the other components we could add on here is, say, a Google Map. All right, we'll resize that to fit this space. And take a look here. All right, so by default, it's centered on um, San Francisco, because some people like to think that's the center of the, <laughs> where things are. I had my notes. I can never remember. All right. So, four, nine, let me get that wrong. Nine, three, nine, one, four is our latitude. Well, roughly, I mean, if you're playing with maps, it's kind of cool because we're about 45 and minus 93. But if you really want to get specific, it's minus 93.1685 and we'll set that zoom level to say 15 alright so here we are zoomed in on McAllister College we've got a map that's built uh, we've got this drawer panel which starts to show off its beauty when we resize the page this drawer panel will hide itself um, and if we look at the code behind We've just built an app with a side uh, drawer panel that's uh, responsive in size, and we've got um, you know ten lines of code here, recentering the map, setting the zoom level. In order to to add a pin, uh, you would drop that inside this Google Map tag. That's pretty cool. Now they they do hide a little bit of CSS in here. I can't blame them for that. So, all right, we're going to leave that page. Um, let's see if it's up. All right. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that um, a competitor's cloud service is up and running. Uh, oh, I don't have it always on. We'll see if this loads. So, uh, anybody in college right now? Uh, a couple of folks. So, there's a service currently, uh, Yik Yak, which is fairly, fairly popular. Um, there's a, the, it's an anonymous, kind of geographically based chatting tool. And uh, the, uh, it is it's on the radar of uh, school administrators, and there's, there's concerns about whether or not, um, well, whatever, social. social Technology is always scary to administrators, right? So I went out on GitHub and found an API for interacting with uh, Yik Yak, set it on uh, McAllister College, just went ahead and found the 100 latest Yik Yaks. Um, this is always dangerous. I'm not even going to click on one because I'm live in front of an audience. <laughs> so if you click on them, you can see. So we're going to go ahead and look at the code behind. Um, so here's the, the amount of code that's needed to get that page up and running. 
right, the, the imports that are needed that are running this entire application. I'm centering my Google map on this, on this, <laughs> this spot. Uh oh. <laughs> um, I'll make it really big so you only get to see the first one. Um, all right, and then so you can add a marker here at the bottom. There's your first marker. And all, all my app is doing basically is, is hitting the API, pulling in the first 100, and looping over them, um, and dropping them as pins on, on the page. They're showing up centered. You click on them, they show, uh, they show the text that's available to you. I mean, this honestly was about less than 15 minutes of work uh, on one of my lunch periods. So I, I thought that was a, a pretty great if maybe not appropriate for public speaking, um, <laughs> proof of concept. And thankfully, of course, most McAllister uh, yaks are, are very healthy and thoughtful. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I had to talk about for, for Polymer. Um, the agenda we've got uh, kind of now-ish, we're, we're uh, freakishly like right on time. Um, the plan right now is that to, the food is set up out in the outer room. Um, we'll have some food, we'll have some networking. We've got, um, we've got this room with there's two conference rooms on the second floor that are, that are maybe easier to sit around and do some, um, actual code lab time. Uh, these, these front rows have a, have what are they called? Tables that flip up, so that might be more, more convenient. So maybe we'll play it by ear. Um, I thought there's 70 people registered, 75 people registered for this event. Um, and it's true, true to hosting an event, almost exactly half showed up. Uh, which is still pretty good on a Wednesday at 4. So we're going to do that until about 9, then we'll reconvene. In this room, prior to nine, I'll walk around and make sure that everybody gets the final um, survey. By filling out the final survey, we'll get you a raffle ticket to be um, eligible for, for one of these cool devices. And also, when you fill out the survey, uh, there's a link to get a free O'Reilly ebook um, as, as part of that. So that's, that's our incentive to, to get you to fill out the survey. So we have some metrics. And what I should do is take the cue from uh, our Dan Rao guy at, uh, at Google who always does this to, to prove to Google <laughs> that we have lots of people here. Can everybody wave and say how much fun you're having at these, uh, these yeah. events? Yeah. All right. See, now they'll maybe support us with more than a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about Palmer? I know I'm in the way between you and Fools. So. Yes. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, any plans on getting to a 1.0? Oh, yeah. They're rapidly, they're rapidly developing towards that. But do you know what 1.0 looks like? like? What the product will look like or what the timeline looks like? What Polymer will look like once it reaches 1.0. <laughs> My, my sense is that it's, it's pretty well on the, on the direction it's heading. Um, they've, in the last version, they changed some, some how you reference the core libraries. Um, and they, it didn't change the functionality of it. It just changed the naming structure of it because it was a little confusing to people getting new to it. I think they're really, they're really underway to refine the process of that. Um, what do you imagine it would look like? Well, we've got a lot of examples of different components that they're implementing from a UI perspective. They said that Polymer is a lot like a, a, a framework that you're not only supposed to do visual elements, but background elements. But how far does that go? You know, what kind of, what kind of uh, services can we expect to implement Polymer? All of them? I would expect all of them. Yeah, there was just a discussion on the, the Polymer discussion board about Firebase. So Google right. acquired Firebase, which is the uh, kind of lightweight front-end uh, database API. We expect parity between Polymer and Android components. Anything an Android component can do, Polymer can do? Question mark? Question mark. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of the debate of native versus, oh, uh, native versus web. Um, 
there's a lot that you can do in the web experience. There's, there's a line that, that gets crossed as far as the experience that you're able to reproduce in a web application. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of over parallel efforts happening with the paper layout. A lot of that new Android uh, UI experience is, is looking pretty similar to that. So they're trying to have that be a consistent experience. Um, but I don't know that I would say Polymer is necessarily going to impact Android as a, as a development environment. Could you comment on the Angular Angular JS and uh, Polymer? No, I know the Angular team is getting uh, influence from Polymer, and that component is going to be 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, any good comments on that? Yeah, there's there's a um, Angular um, library to in, import that will implement Polymer uh, within it, and and they're they're cross compatible. So they're 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 working together to, to produce a you know living in the, the Angular world yeah. and kind of the syntactic um, expressions that you're used to working with. Directive is going to be the best component and things like that. So. Right. All right. Thank you. I just came from work. I, was, I just wanted to turn for us. Yeah, I go to these a lot. Yeah, so the new one is. So this is a star from scratch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reactive. Yeah, it's a lot better. It's a lot better. So yeah, it's like. This is how it's updated. Yeah, so we have like coupons. You can select that. Every time we get something good. Yeah, you can add. It adds to your shopping list. Someone who does not match is that like, oh, you just got Yeah, these are all the things that just got printed. Right, right. So we're just working on a bunch of stuff, man. I think it's a good thing to get into. So what language? What language did you start off learning? 
I started oh, off with yeah. just Java. Same. <laughs> Java's Java's tough to start out with, but it's also it's. I mean, you can do a lot with it once you understand it. So, so where 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 did you learn from? Because I'm right now I'm just doing like Code Academy and like books that I find online. Does Code Academy have Java, or are you talking about JavaScript? JavaScript. So JavaScript. Okay, that's more like internet. Uh, so the web web based stuff like polymer stuff yeah that he's talking about yeah it's kind of cumbersome i never <laughs> like what as long as you learn one really well then it's easier to go or you know to other languages yeah i'm excited about it just i heard playing Java i was talking really to a couple good. devs it gives you a good basis it's hard really to start out yeah. but once you understand it um, you can really go anywhere because I was doing, doing they were saying that I did job I for like I started off like a year ago. I just did job still. Like, oh, so, yeah. I was like, then you know, well, this like, I just did things. I don't know. What do you think about that?